Oh, hey, yeah, I even got the Linkara welcome wagon. You look familiar. Did I try and kill you during NerdQuest? I knew you vaguely remember me, and what better excuse to re-team for a crossover then? Oh, sure, I'd love to. Uh, except I'm not, I'm not in the UK right now. Um, I'm in Germany. Oh. Yeah. Well, scheisse. Hmm. Well, I see your grasp of the German language is just as good as mine. Well, we could still work around that. You got any ideas? We could do a rom-com. I assume you have a couple handy. Oh, yeah, that makes sense. I've seen you review a couple of them, like Love Actually, Wimbledon, Legally Blonde. Oh, yeah. I like Legally Blonde. Oh, that's unfortunate, because the guy who directed that also directed The Ugly Truth. Oh dear. And that wasn't the only movie he did with Catherine Heigl, because he re-teamed with her for Killers. And that sounds about perfect. How soon can you write a script? Oh, at the first available opportunity. I'm curious, Matthew. When did you finish the script for this episode? Oh, about a week ago. Yesterday. I see. Okay, that was really weird. Um... Say, have you ever heard this fellow called Welshy, perchance? Are you implying that because I'm a redhead, I'm a dude? Oh, no, 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 that's, that's not what I meant. Good. Because I would have to give you a stern reprimand. Uh, do, do you think we should start recording our review? Yes. Let's. Welcome to Battery Beatdown! In this special crossover with stuff you like! Wait, that, that isn't going to be a problem, is it? No, I've reviewed things I don't like on the show before. I mean, do you think I enjoyed watching The Mummy, Tomb of the Dragon Emperor? Um, no? Right, and besides, I'm sure someone likes this movie. What, Catherine Heigl and Ashton Kutcher and Killers? Not oh, many, I bet. See, I quite liked the debut of Australian director Robert Lukedic, Legally Blonde, in which a woman who was underestimated for appearing to be a stereotype was actually a lot more intelligent and nuanced than she appeared. Yeah, she started that trip to law school to try and win back her ex, but it was clear even before then that she didn't really need him. Elle was generally a very empowered female character and it was quite a smart movie. However, given the rom-coms that Lukedic went on to do, and the fact that I watched Killers, I think we can chalk that one up to the script rather than the direction. Oh yeah, I've already lambasted Lukatic for the hideous The Ugly Truth, which is one of the most propellant examples of the genre I have ever witnessed, mostly because it centers on the sexual humiliation of its star, Catherine Heigl, queen of the god-awful rom-com. Even Heigl herself has admitted recently that although she loves romantic comedies, she hit them too hard and it became a bit row, harming her career. I'm sure the fact that you publicly denounced your breakout hit and knocked up for being a bit sexist in her eyes, and then taking a whole bunch of roles that definitely were sexist had nothing to do with that. Just a year after Ugly Truth, Lukatic and Heigl re-teamed for another vehicle with Killers, an action comedy that is yet another failed attempt to try and make something for guys and girls on date night and is totally not an obvious copy of Mr. and Mrs. Smith. And who better to co-star than a celebrity even more unpopular with audiences like Ashton Kutcher, who is also one of the film's producers through his own Catalyst Media Company. Company. Kutcher taking a vested interest in a movie where he gets to play James Bond, who would have guessed? 
best. Originally written as a straight action movie before given a more comedic edge, Killers was at the time Lionsgate's biggest budgeted movie at $75 million, as they were attempting to cement themselves as a major studio. But in retrospect, it almost seems absurd they expected this to be a major hit. They obviously came a long way with the Hunger Games. And clearly they knew it was awful too, as they didn't screw it for critics, who were naturally very negative once they got their hands on it. So negative, in fact, as the third lowest rated wide release on Metacritic in 2010, sharing such great company as Vampire Suck and The Last Airbender. Unsurprisingly, the movie underperformed, and Lionsgate even blamed it for their first quarter losses that year. Ouch. It's still not as painful as actually having to watch it. Too right, as Killers is so bad it might want to make you kill someone. Or at least grievous bodily harm. Oh, after the review, Matty. After the review. We open on a plane that looks like it came from the 70s, appropriately enough, where we meet Jen, played by Catherine Heigl, trapped on a plane with her overbearing parents, played by Tom Selleck and Catherine O'Hara, on their way to Nice. I am so proud of you, sweetie. A lot of women who just got dumped would have backed out of this vacation, but not you. Thanks, Dad, but I didn't get dumped. It wasn't quite like that. It, it was mutual. Yes, they agreed to part ways when he dumped her. I thought it was because he needed space. No, he just didn't find her spontaneous enough. Too safe. Predictable. I am sitting right here. She tried to get you to go bungee jump, but you wouldn't do it. Oh, I have a thing about heights and a rule about vomiting in public. I think that's perfectly reasonable. Too many rules, dear. We are barely a minute in, and her parents are already just outright explaining her backstory and personality. This level of cliché does not require this level of explanation. Catherine Heigl's playing an uptight stick in the mud who just needs to find a man? Gee, what a starting departure from every role she's ever played. Hell, the opening credits haven't even appeared on screen yet, where we see Ashton Kutcher's Spencer getting a new assignment and driving around in a Ferrari in a way that's probably meant to resemble a 60s spy caper, but makes Kutcher look like an arrogant poser. And frankly, this amount of gratuitous car and scenery porn deserves a Jeremy Clarkson commentary. He's not so susly pursuing this blatantly CGI helicopter which has an arms dealer in it and you know what, it doesn't even matter. He's just doing generic spy stuff, damn it! So hang on a wee second. Kutcher's random Bond girl takes her hair down before driving off in the open top Ferrari. I can't help but feel you're doing it wrong, love. Maybe it's a disguise? Oh yes. I'm sure wherever she's going in that Ferrari, a woman with wild, windswept hair will fit right in. And coincidentally, Spencer and his girl check into the same hotel as Jen and company. She'll never be spoken of again. You have my wife and I on the second floor and my daughter on the third, when I specifically booked adjacent rooms. I assure you, your room is lovely, Mr. Lovely Confell. and adjacent are not the same thing. She's a single woman, all alone. Oh. Dad, the room is fine. Can Do you, you know how it? many push-in robberies happen in hotels, sweetie? Third floor, we'd like an ocean view. So, more embarrassing parents? Blah, blah, blah. You know, I'm coming to the realisation that I really don't like these people. You know, I don't know which is worse here. The pushy parents who treat her like a child, or the fact she allows them to steamroll her over her. She just wants to be independent, damn it! Whatever issues you have are yours and yours alone. Jen ends up in a lift by herself when, hello shirtless Ashton Kutcher, taking any excuse to show off those abs, are we? I'm just saying, this is a very literal translation of meat cute. This one? Mm-hmm. Mm. Ça doit être un jour ambiant, si vous prenez la sassée, pour le plaisir. You know, it's really a toss-up which of those is more awkward. The French or the chemistry. But can't you feel that sexual tension between them? Man, I haven't seen that many sparks since a couple that can't stand to be in the same room together. Yeah, it doesn't get better. It continues on this level for the rest of the movie. Nobody got game. 
Spencer even signals his romantic interest by walking about five feet behind her as she goes down to the pool, which in no way resembles stalking. Somehow smitten, they agree to meet for dinner at sunset, which causes a major panic for her because she's missing a cute dress. An odd thing to forget when you're going on holiday in France. As she sorts out womanly things, Spencer is completing his mission to sneak onto the arms dealer's boat and plant a bomb on his helicopter, taking out the one guard who managed to notice this, intercut with Dan Daddy talking about finding a nice man. Wah, wah. Are we seriously meant to believe that Ashton Kutcher is a secret agent? He is the most preening, conspicuous spy ever. He looks more ready to whip out his camera phone for a selfie than a gun. And even the action scene there is so unconvincing, it looks either like a fashion shoot or an advert for some man stink body spray shilling. Remorseless killing machine is several thousand yards outside of his range. And he shows up to dinner in a tux. You're still not fooling anyone. Just like how it's clearly the middle of the day, even though it's supposed to be sundown. That said, they do have some charming moments occasionally. That was a joke. I am a dating robot sent here to observe your ways. <laughs> you just pulled a robot voice. Oh, oh, this is so unlike how normal people behave. They might as well be robots. Although, that being said, Kevin Heigl is acting a lot more natural here. When Jen's parents appear, she promptly dies under the table, and he senses there's something wrong because this doesn't usually happen so early into the date. Are you on the lamb? Hey, you see that guy over by the menus? Freakishly tall, excellent mustache. That is a gorgeous mustache. He's a Russian diplomat, also kind of a pervert. Sat next to him on the plane, got a little grabby. Really? Wait, 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 wait. Women don't like grabby? That's, I'm gonna have to change my whole MO. <laughs> we've all had that moment where we've had to claim our parent was a pervert and then fought up with a quip about sexual assault. Isn't it romantic? No. Anyway, they have to hide under a table now because of the plot. Though sadly, this will not stop said plot making absolutely no sense. As Spencer takes her elsewhere, he detonates the departing helicopter before hitting the club. What do you do? Consulting? I'm a consultant for a company. Company consulting. I think we've been doing a lot of downsizing. I travel a lot. So downsizing. People. Well, if you could do anything, you know, anything in the world, what would you do? I just think it'd be nice to put down some roots, you know? I've actually always wanted to know my neighbors. I've never had that before. Do you not have a plausible cover story, Ashton Kutcher? Is that not something they teach you in spy school? And somehow, we've managed to find the thing even less plausible than him as a secret agent. As someone who wants to settle down in suburbia. Seriously, what the hell? No, you need to reserve that response for when they go up to Jen's room and she has a little bit of trouble with her very tight dress. This dress is really, really tight. <laughs> I need to get out of it. Seriously, I've been sucking at it all night. Can you just, you gotta get it off. Just take it off. Really? Yeah, take it off. Okay. Yeah, all let's right. do this. The, the zipper's stuck. Just break it, it's fine. My father will pay for it. Break it. Yeah, break it. Right here, just, just turn it. Stay, st don't. <gasps> oh my still. God. <gasps> Whoa! Dude, you just had to rip out of the dress. You didn't have to strip it with your big fuck off knife that you apparently keep on you at all times. This, this is not romantic. This, this is creepy and mm. suddenly very threatening. Thank you for being so honest. I actually feel like I should share something with you. It's gonna be really hard to say, but I feel like you're real. So I wanna be real with you. I really told anybody this before, but I kill people. Awesome. You take a woman out on one date and already you're planning to settle down with her and reveal your secret identity? Slow down a bit, mate. And uh, maybe, just, just maybe, save the whole I kill people speech for some time when she's not, you know, lying drunk and naked on a bed. Well, you know, after this one time, he'll never try and tell her again. What?
But this is only the start of their whirlwind romance, which has attracted the attention of Spencer's CIA handler Holbrook, played by Martin Mull, and when they meet up, Spencer expresses his doubt over his targets and his intention to walk away. See, he's walking away, just like that. So not only do we have to fight Ashton Kutcher as a spy, but the principal from Sabrina the Teenage Witch is his boss? Are we sure they're the elite of the CIA and not heading up the full schedule for CBS? On their return to America, Spencer spends time getting to know the in-laws. This scene, where he announces his intention to marry Jen to her father, is probably my favourite in the movie. They're both feeling each other out as they take shots both at the discs and each other, and clearly, they both want the best for her. I especially like how Spencer admits that she's not a China doll and he's more reliant on her stability than the other way around. It's nicely played, it's just a shame that the movie ends up disproving that argument. We then skip ahead three years, which you can tell because Jen has a new haircut, having transitioned smoothly into married life, and small-town Americana ensues, as many comedians appear. Yeah, there's Alex Borstein from Family Guy, and the comic book shop owner from The Big Bang Theory, and that's Casey Wilson from Saturday Night Live, and there's Rob Riggle from every unfunny comedy you've seen in the last five years. Are you just name-checking all of these people and where you recognise them from because you're bored? Yeah, sorry. Oh no, no, go right ahead. I wasn't stopping you. Oh. Well, okay then. Jen has got herself a job flogging shitty antivirus software, and Spencer has become an architect, with Riggle playing his really gross, irritating boss, Henry. Hey, listen, do me a favor. Grab some flooring samples for Olivia, all right? Something durable that cleans up easy, in case we decide to have sex on the floor. You worry, she on it. Oh, <laughs> I like her even more when she's mean to me. You're gonna give me a lawsuit. Probably. She gets aggravated, though, you know, when I flirt with other women. That's what it is. You do realize that only happens in pornos. Yeah, the good pornos. <laughs> I'm gonna give her a shot. As soon as I'm done letting Olivia do dirty things to me. Well, that's gonna take a while. We don't really know what jokes to write in this bit, so here's a skeezy character talking about sex and porn all the time because that's hilarious by itself, apparently. Are we sure that Chuck Lorre isn't an executive producer on this? How long have you two been married? What, like three years? Yeah. Okay. Mm. See, that's your problem. I have a problem. Everyone always talks about the seven-year itch. But no one mentions the three-year snooze. People get complacent. Okay, otherwise you're growing out your leg hair, you're growing out your down there hair, and you're wearing your fat jeans and a pair of Spanx. And the next thing you know, he runs off with a reality TV star named Shonda. Shonda speaks six languages, and one of those languages is sex. Are you gonna eat that? Getting a hungs, super hungs over here. Oh, wonderful! A girl talk about boys! And food! And sex! And boys! But at least they haven't talked about shoes! I don't know about a three-year snooze, but I'm about ready for a 20-minute nap because everything that's going on here is just setting up what happens later in the most workmanlike way possible. The dialogue is dry and unfunny, these seemingly minor characters are going to become important, these reindeer chandeliers are transparent Chekhov's guns, and the tedium is so heavy you could cut it with Spencer's enormous scary knife. Jen asks her father to pick up Spencer as it's the weekend of his birthday. Unfortunately, Holbrook has sent another coded message saying that he's in town, which they really weakly try to make humorous by giving him a girl's name as his disguise, Yawn, which Dad stumbles in on and makes his moustache most bemused. They go home where they throw Spencer a surprise party. Ugh. Okay, well, I'm gonna take a little nap. Uh, wake me when somebody starts killing somebody else. Will do. Nighty night. Don't let the travel lodge bug bite. The party eventually clears out, except for Henry who sleeps overnight on the sofa in his undies. Yes, they even do a fart joke here, they're that stuck for laughs. Jen is still worrying about her husband as she goes out to a conference on his birthday. Did you guys have fun last night? Oh yeah, it was great. You're still taking Spence out tonight though, right? Just get yourself on the plane. Let us take care of Spence, okay? Okay, well I'll call you when I get to San Francisco. Love you. Love you too, dude. Bye. Mm. This is seriously the only joke they gave Catherine O'Hara, that she's a functional alcoholic drinking in every scene she appears in. Ha <laughs> ha, she's got some serious psychological issues. And also, don't talk on your phone while you're in the car. At least use your Bluetooth headset or something, you stupid woman. Can you keep it down a bit? Henry gets a mysterious text message, and that's when things kick into gear. <laughs> What are you doing? 
kill anybody. Wake up! Killing is happening! Oh, killing? Yay, fun! Look out, he's got a spatula! Finally, a full 45 minutes, halfway into the movie, and a half hour after the last action scene, the plot has at last started moving. Thank you, finally. Maybe something interesting will happen now. The fight choreography for the sequence is largely played very straight. They aren't making wise cracks, it's played as a shock. Which might have worked if, you know, this was not supposed to be a comedy. It's clearly one of those movies where the script wasn't funny, so they just stuck a load of comedians in it, because they'll make it funny. Which leads to the really odd situation of people with no weapons training or skills training pretending to be professional hit men. Wait, is that the joke? You know, after the last 20 minutes, I will take anything. Jen decides she's not going to the conference after all, which is never brought up again, because fighting! And oh great, she's instantly doing a useless shrieking harpy shtick. Sure she's not a china doll? Hey, I find the way she carries the gun when she grabs it to be quite endearing, if ludicrously dangerous. They manage to incapacitate Henry and tape him up, and I suppose it's kind of funny, and it sort of works. Maybe? If you squint a little? Or if you find lines lisp through broken teeth amusing, I guess. As Henry slips that Spencer has a $20 million bounty on his head. And given it's Ashton Kutcher, that means that just about anybody could be lined up to kill him. They're suddenly interrupted by bullets being fired by... Someone. Why are you running? You don't know where they're coming from. And why isn't the next door neighbor standing at the front door not calling the police already? Who do you work for? Is it the mob? I can't tell you. If I tell you, they could kill you too. But to say that I work for the blah, 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 and they gave me a license to blah. <laughs> Jibbers, this dialogue is horrendous. Why couldn't he have just said he was in the CIA? Someone actually committed that line to paper. License to blah is right. Henry comes after them once more, and a car chase ensues as intrusive, upbeat, lightweight comedy music blares away. Seriously, how is no one nursing the guy firing a machine gun in the middle of suburbia as they drive across people's gardens? Things eventually reach a standoff at a construction site, where Spencer knocks Henry's car off a ledge and onto some spikes. Oh, that was a surprisingly brutal way to kill off a largely comic character. Yeah, I don't, I don't think we're meant to laugh at someone being impaled on, on sharp pointy things. Yeah, no. Spencer reveals his backstory to Jen, that he was hired in college when both his parents died and wow, this whole acting thing is not, not a particular strength of his. How many people, Spencer? Four. Fifteen. It's fifteen. Is fifteen your real number? Or is that like when you ask a girl how many guys she slept with and you have to double it and times it by ten? I didn't do that. I'm just... 15 is my number. This conversation seems like it's trying really hard to be funny, but it really isn't. You know, I think it's because they're having a light-hearted conversation about how many people he's brutally murdered. With what? His chiseled good looks? They go to the hotel where Holbrook is staying to find out what's going on, but unfortunately he's been assassinated. Boy, these laughs never stop coming, do they? They figure out his watch is far too ostentatious, and since it has a slot for a portable drive in it, it's time for Jen to be useful at techie, geeky things for a change. Yeah, it's best not to tell that cleaning woman or all those kids in the swimming pool about the dead guy. Jen wants to bring her parents into this, but Spencer doesn't, so we get one of those wonderful state of the relationship talks. She finds this as nauseating as we do, but that might just be because she's pregnant. Um, so folks, not happy could I be of some assistance? Yes. Yes, you can. Uh, uh, Kevin, <laughs> which one of these is the most accurate? Jen, I don't think he's a pregnancy test expert. Well, first response seems to be pretty popular. Um, can't seem to keep it on the shelf. Perfect. There you go. Look at that. It's on sale. Well, this is certainly an odd place to have an Usher cameo. I wasn't aware that things were so bad in the music industry that he was reduced to working in Kmart. See, this scene is funny because he was about to shoot a shop assistant right in the middle of a supermarket. Actually, when I put it that way, it's kind of a bit grim.
So after our big dose of product placement, they steal another car, and Spencer checks into the CIA to see what targets Holbrook had, only to discover he's inactive. With that lead gone, they go to Henry's office to find anything, and on his computer stumble onto photos of the couple, ones that Spencer swears was taken by Jen's dad. Hint, hint. Of course that's when they're not constantly bickering. Uh, maybe, maybe we should piss on a stick now. That'd be a good idea. It is a good idea because I do have to pee. Grab my gun. You can't just walk out in... You are aware people are trying to kill us. I really have to go. For God's sakes, just turn the light on. It's not like there's a lot of places to hide. Just humor me. Okay, Catherine Heigl. I know that you're pregnant and probably hormonal, but people are trying to kill you. You can't just wander off in a huffy strop. Don't you just love it in supposedly romantic comedies how the couple spends the entire movie sniping at each other? Metaphorically, of course, not literally. Jen needs a moment to take the test, so Spencer goes outside to find his secretary Vivian is inexplicably wandering around. Oh, what a surprise. She's another assassin. I suppose it was about time for an action scene. It's been 20 minutes since someone got shot at. Is it me or does Ashton Kutch get smashed through loads of windows in this movie? Not complaining, of course, just an observation. Hey, you, you stop it! Ah! Honey, I don't, I don't know how to. It's not, it's not shooting. I, I don't. Oh God! I... And Chekhov's antlers. Does anyone know what this movie's fascination with impalement is all about? And Jim can't even be accidentally useful because it's Spencer that fires off the stray shot that knocks down the antler, and he's still being strangled. Just. Sit in the corner there, love, and be pregnant. You're good at that. And yes, she is pregnant, but now she's worried that Spencer's not good dad material. Is anyone else getting mood whiplash? Comedy, death, motherhood, breakup. No one wants marital strife in their action movies. Die Hard accepted. Spencer gets a message on Henry's phone revealing who the killer is. I bet you'll never guess, but you probably will. More routine action follows as a delivery guy tries to kill him, who is in turn run down by Olivia, who was trying to seduce Spencer earlier, but now also sets her sights on the bounty. At this point, I'd be more surprised if some random supporting character didn't happen to be an assassin. And then she gets hit by the returning Jen, who knocks her into the generic exploding tank of doom. Uh, hello? Where are the police in this movie? It's it's 2010 when this film takes place. If you saw a giant explosion, would, would you not be on your phone? Which is also precisely the reason why professional hitmen don't go off their targets with machine guns like they do in this movie. So after that five minutes of drama and stealing another car, maybe they'll trust each other a bit more. Ha <laughs> ha, nope. What do we do okay. right now? Right now we're gonna go to the house. I got a go bag, we got money, weapons, passports, we're set. Why exactly do we have a go bag? Spencer, did you know this was gonna happen? No, I didn't know. You are lying! No, lying. Am I telling you everything? No, I'm not telling you everything. Okay, but we're married. That's what married people do, honey. They lie to each other. They tell people things that aren't true to keep them safe and to protect one another when they ask things like if they have their mother's arms. Ugh, please stop making out that married people habitually lie to each other. It's rude and it's a gross generalization and man, are they awkward together. You know, maybe this could have been avoided if he actually told her he was a spy, you know, like he was going to. And then again, given their entire life is a lie, isn't this just arguing semantics? I'm taking us to my parents' house. We are not house. going yes. to your parents' yes, house. Yes, we are. We are not. I said yes! Listen to me. We cannot go to your parents. You have to trust me. Tell her why she can't go to her parents, you muppet. Explain. Use your words. But if he did, he would spoil the big twist. And that would be a travesty. Their car breaks down, so they have to walk back home. Because there's nothing like strolling into a neighborhood you know is full of sleeper agents that could randomly attack. Like right now, as Big Bang and Lois Griffin start taking their shots at them. <laughs> Amazing. Nice bit of product placement.
placement there. I'll certainly bear that in mind next time I attempt vehicular homicide. And if you're wondering how absolutely everyone managed to miss that, it's because they're all at the block party they're hosting, unfazed by the gunfire and carnage today. Yeah, it's suddenly become July 4th now. What the hell is going on with the time frame? Remember when it was Spencer's birthday? They make it back home to pick up their new identities, but the assassins are persistent and sneak in undetected. Spencer spots them and hides in the closet, quickly overpowers them and kills the husband. Things aren't great for Jen downstairs, though, as she finds her mum being held at gunpoint by Casey Wilson's Kristen, who threatens to shoot them both, which is really not going to make sense in the next few moments, but Jen's father takes care of it. Answer the phone, sir. My dead best friend wants to let you know that your target's still alive. Stand down, Spencer. Whoa, hey, guys. He killed Holbrook, and then he pulled the trigger on me. I put sleepers in your life because I didn't trust your husband. I hoped I'd never have to use it. His old boss turned dirty. And in your office, when I saw that card with his name on it, I knew you were back in the game and you were coming after me. So it was her, her father who was behind all this? Um, okay. I, I know this, this may seem blatantly obvious, but... That doesn't make any sense. Especially since, as we just saw, several of the killers were going after Daddy's little girl as well. But wait, it gets better. I'm not trying to kill you, sir. Why don't you tell her about Nice where you tried to blow me up? How do you know about Nice? I was supposed to be on that helicopter. When I saw you, I didn't go. What? I just, you, the... take over, Matthew. So, he activated the killers because Spencer's boss went dirty, even though the fact that he was going on a helicopter with an arms dealer means that he also turned traitor as well. And talk about a coincidence that he just happened to meet and fall in love with the daughter of the target he was assigned to kill. This is just completely nonsensical! How'd I do? Yeah, I think that about covers it. Spencer puts his gun down to show his faithfulness, but Daddy only relents when he learns about the pregnancy and shoots Lois Griffin, the last sleeper. And then, just when things can't get any worse, they form a trust circle. I finally understand that I am not to blame for this dynamic, okay? You are. So, if any of you want to ever see this kid, this is what's going to happen, okay? There will be... No more lying. No more stealing cars or hiding weapons in the furniture. And I never want to see you two try to kill each other again, okay? In fact, there will be no more killing. I don't want to see you swat a fucking fly, okay? Whew. Why aren't you madder at your father? He is the one who caused all of this through some stupid misunderstanding. People are dead because of him. Is there anything else that I need to or should know? English is not my first language. Oh, I'm by time, I thought. Jan! We need to talk about that dark property guy. <laughs> Hi, Jan. <laughs> uh, sweetie, I don't think she was a killer. I just felt like physically assaulting someone. The movie then skips over how they managed to dispose of all those bodies to a year later, where Spencer's trying to copy Daddy's mustache, ha <laughs> ha, and they're overprotecting the baby by surrounding it in lasers. That poor child being born into this family. And that was Killers. What'd you think of it, Ursa? Why, Matthew? Why did you do this to me? I want to say there are some positives here. There are a few lines I laughed at, about five or six maybe. The action sequences are largely comprehensible and it's nice to see equal opportunity fatalities and ugly deaths, but when it comes to the fridge logic test, this movie just makes no sense. It's mildly charming, but largely dull for its first half. And once the plot does kick in, it just whiplashes back and forth and ends in the stupidest yet most obvious manner possible. I cannot stress enough how boring this movie is. It's such a lightweight, trifle that it almost floats away while you're watching it. The most fatal 
for is miscasting. You couldn't have picked worse people if you tried. Catherine Heigl spends the entire movie being shrill and annoying, and Ashton Kutcher as a spy is just mind-boggling. It's a rom-com in disguise, but the action scenes are leaden and spaced out, and I doubt anyone would find them satisfying, especially since none of them are particularly humorous. Everything in between is just them whining and moaning. Going through a third-rate plot, there was at least a lot more fun when it had Arnold Schwarzenegger in it. You know, the mother's functional alcoholism makes a lot more sense when you realise that her husband is an assassin. Hell, I want a drink and I just watch the movie. I say we go to this panel, get some fish bowls for the vodka and just get blitzed. Sounds like a plan. Yeah. I'm Matthew Buck. I'm Sir Samarsa. Beating down bad movies everywhere. Bye! <laughs>